Thank you very much. Um, so in this talk, basically what I want to do is I first want to introduce briefly the role of facial expressions in multimodal communication. Then I will present a data-driven approach uh, that I will propose can kind of give a more quantitative and objective way uh, of studying facial expressions. And then I'll show some of the results uh, that we have obtained with this method, uh, showing that uh, how facial expressions are used across different social messages, different contexts, and different cultures. And finally, I'll uh, show you some work in progress on the iconicity and pragmatics of facial expressions. So if you've attended the plenary this morning, you, I probably don't have to tell you that uh, communication and language is uh, highly multimodal. So we know also from uh, other primates that they can actually use different channels like uh, vocal signals, uh, as well as visual information via gestures. And in humans, this is really the culmination of multimodal signals where we actually integrate these readily. Uh, for example, pairing speech with gestures and also facial expressions, say for to express surprise or happiness, for example. And in the language sciences, we have kind of seen this uh, multimodal shift almost uh, where now we are much less uh, considering language in isolation. And actually, uh, you can also see this in debates about language evolution, where in the beginning, this was also in the plenary, there was a lot of emphasis on speech first versus gesture first, but now we're slowly moving away from that and actually considering the complex interplay between these different modalities and channels, uh, also in the early multimodal beginnings, including also these kind of theories like um, pantomime, for example, as a human-specific precursor to language. And however, while these uh, theories, they uh, talk about, about uh, they talk a lot about multimodality, they do mention facial expressions, uh, but usually they only mention it and uh, focus on other things like uh, gesture. And this is partly due to the fact that historically facial expressions have initially kind of been more studied by uh, affective scientists, for example, biologists and psychologists, starting really with Darwin, who initially criticized an earlier idea uh, by Charles Bell about facial expressions as kind of divine expressions of human passions. And Darwin instead uh, argued uh, that uh, they do actually have a biological basis and are shared uh, with other animals. And we can also use them to convey social messages and study them biologically. And this was then later, uh, later picked up by psychologists like Ackman, for example, who use facial expressions to argue for basic human emotions like sadness and, and happiness and so on. But face-to-face -face interaction is, of course, the primary way in which we communicate. Uh, you could also call it the core ecological niche for language, uh, as other, others have uh, said. And uh, in, in these settings, uh, facial expressions form kind of part of very complex multi multiplex multimodal signals, uh, which is very nicely shown in this paper by Holler and Levinson. For example, when we ask questions, we don't just produce a question word and combine that with what we're asking about. We also usually raise our pitch uh, and provide some kind of quizzical look to signal that we're actually asking a question. And in fact, this uh, integration of uh, different modalities and data streams seems to actually facilitate processing uh, for example, in this study, they showed that uh, direct, both direct eye gaze and the presence of gestures uh, decreased reaction times and made it actually easier to react uh, to what is said in speech. And overall, however, there's still very few studies uh, looking at facial expressions in actual dialogue and how they're used in communication, which is partly, again, due to the history, but partly also because of the sheer number and complexity of facial expressions. And so methods studying facial expressions have mostly relied on uh, qualitative and observational uh, kind of ways of studying this, for example, with conversation analysis, where you kind of just count, uh, let's say, how often someone looks into a specific uh, uh, side of the screen or uh, how often they nod and things like that. However, I want to propose here that we can actually study facial expressions in a more quantitative way, because even though they are highly complex, uh, we want to suggest uh, that we can study them because uh, they are comprised of independent visible movements called action units uh, that enable these very complex dynamic patterns. And uh, each of these movements can combine with others to give rise to uh, a wide variety of messages, including emotions, conversational messages, and also personality traits. And each action unit can actually be activated with different dynamics. And then basically so, uh, the individual uh, action units combine to a complex message, uh, which then gives rise to this wide variety of nuanced messages that I just talked about, including emotions, conversation messages, and so on. So if I show you, for example, this uh, 
face, you might think that this person is uh, angry or disgusted because this is a facial expression that's actually familiar to you. It's something that most people would know. However, if I show you this face, uh, most people would not be so sure. It, it doesn't really look like something familiar because it's not something that you've seen before. And now the psychophysical twist here is that actually both of these facial expressions uh, have been generated completely randomly. So they have not been hand-selected by me or by anyone else. And we're actually using the perception of the receivers viewing these images to identify which ones are socially meaningful and which are not. And critically, by testing a broad range of facial expressions uh, sampled in this agnostic way, uh, this enables us to build models of facial expressions in a kind of more quantitative data-driven manner. So how did we actually uh, generate these facial expressions? We're using a, a dynamic uh, phase movement generator comprised of a library of these individual action units uh, where each action unit was captured using a, a stereoscopic camera system from a real human who was specially trained to control each movement independently. And this way we can then build this library, including all these individual movements that we can combine for our experiments. And during an experiment, we then randomly sample a subset of these phase movements uh, that determine, uh, and we give it parameters that um, determine, which you can see here in, in these uh, curves, uh, how fast or how strong these movements are activated and then combine them to one single random dynamic facial expressions. Uh, and participants then view this uh, expression on a trial uh, and then they have to categorize it, for example, uh, in accordance to the basic emotions, uh, if and only if the facial expression corresponds to their prior knowledge. Otherwise they would select others. So here maybe they think it, it looks like sad, for example. And this means that on each trial, we can capture the specific dynamic action unit patterns that actually convey this, this emotion, for example, to that person or another social message. And after many such trials, we can then build a statistical relationship between the dynamic action unit patterns presented on each trial and the participants' responses to produce a mathematical model of each facial expression. This means we have a precise quantitative representation of each facial expression that we can then formally analyze and also, uh, for example, compare across cultures. We also compute models for each individual participant to estimate, um, for example, population variance and to demonstrate replication of the results across a large number of participants. A further benefit of this kind of agnostic approach, of course, is that it makes no a priori assumptions about which facial expressions are meaningful to whom. So if we want to study uh, cultural variation, this is especially useful because it avoids experimental biases or maybe it's not dependent on intuition of what we think about facial expressions. So here you can see, for example, facial expressions for uh, Western and East Asian participants that we collected separately. Uh, and now looking at a different set of social messages, namely uh, conversational messages like thinking or bored. Uh, here, my colleagues use the same approach uh, to, uh, to look at the patterns um, across Western and East Asian participants. And you can see that we can then look at the activation and compare which one is similar uh, and which one is different. You can see, for example, there's some variation here actually, uh, like for example, the open mouth and the confused expression between these two cultures. So with this method, we can then uh, isolate the action units that are shared across cultures. For example, for thinking, this would be the lip tightener and the lip presser. For interested, uh, this would be the inner and outer brow raiser or the lip corner puller. For bored, it would be eyes closed and upper lip raiser. And for confused, uh, it would be the brow lower and nose sprinkler. However, we can also identify the action units that differ. And for confused, uh, you saw it earlier already uh, in the first graph that I showed. The Western participants like uh, to, uh, or they, they perceive the lip stretcher as more associated with confused, whereas the East Asian participants uh, perceive the jaw drop to be more involved in uh, confused expressions and an open mouth. So uh, with these methods uh, in our lab and the face syntax ERC project, uh, we've been using this approach of agnostically sampling phase movements and using cultural perception to build these dynamic models of facial expressions in a wide range uh, of different studies exploring uh, cultural variants and commonalities and expressions and emotions, uh, and also a broader range of social messages in, involving also, for example, pain and pleasure, personality traits.
And now coming back to language evolution, uh, we know that one of the fundamental uh, problems is how to kind of bootstrap or establish a communication system in the first place. And here, iconicity has often been uh, called a solution because if I produce something that looks like what I want to talk about, then it's easier for the receiver to kind of retrieve the meaning. And in recent years, it has been found that iconicity is really pervasive, not only in gestures, but also, for example, in vocalizations, like in this recent paper. Uh, and what's interesting here is that different modalities, so while gesture is usually uh, one of the best modalities to represent things iconically, different modalities seem to be better at iconically rep representing specific reference. So for example, the vocal modality, while not very good at representing objects iconically, it's much better for emotions. And for the face, of course, we also know that it's very good at representing emotions. Uh, but what I would be interested in is what else can the face uh, actually communicate? So if we think about uh, the signaling space, the human face is actually capable of producing a, a wide variety of different shapes that kind of expand or contract the face, that kind of stretch and scrunch the face across several dimensions, almost like gestures in 3D space. Uh, and so the question is, are these movements, uh, do they actually have some iconic potential and could they also be used in conversations, for example, to emphasize points or even to visualize what we're talking about? And if so, what meanings can they actually express? And uh, according to Darwin, these movements uh, of contraction and expansion initially actually evolved uh, to benefit the expressor. So that, for example, closing the face would protect against uh, contaminants from the environment or opening up the eyes and mouth, for example, in this fear expression would increase the visual field and oxygen intake also kind of as a protective measure. And then given the high uh, visual salience, his theory was that uh, these phase movements would then uh, later be Kind of evolve into signals for social communication because they're actually grounded in the sensory real world and really salient. And uh, we thus might actually expect iconic movements that expand or contract the face to be found in uh, expressions that communicate certain social messages like emotions or conversational messages. Although, as we have seen earlier, there might be some uh, cultural variation, of course. And so we recently reanalyzed some data from two reverse correlation studies uh, on the six basic emotions and four conversational messages that you also saw earlier. Uh, and we can then look which social messages uh, systematically feature these phase movements. Uh, for example, looking at contraction movements. So this would be, for example, lowering the brows or pressing the lips or wrinkling the nose. Uh, if these are actually a sign of rejection, we would expect them to be more associated with negative messages. And on the x-axis, I'm plotting valence here. And you can actually see that more of these green and uh, blue uh, face movements, uh, so contraction movements, are more associated with the negative messages. On the other hand, uh, expansion movements like uh, raising the brows or opening the mouth uh, are more on the positive side, so in, involved in positive messages. And, and this is the y-axis. They are also involved in more high arousal messages such as anger and fear. And uh, this is also true for East Asian participants. And I'm going to give you some more concrete examples uh, of what that looks like. Uh, so for example, uh, for both cultures, action units related to expanding the brows were significantly related to positive messages such as surprise and interested, uh, and also happy and thinking in, in the East Asian participants. And in both cultures, several movements that expand the face, uh, like dilating the nostrils or parting the lips, were also involved in high arousal messages such as anger or fear. Whereas contracting movements, uh, such as, for example, wrinkling the nose or uh, raising the upper lip, were exclusively associated with negative messages uh, across cultures. Um, however, some contraction movements were less straightforward. For example, the brow lower um, was associated with negative messages, uh, but also thinking in both cultures. And similarly, while uh, tightening the eyelids was associated with anger, and said by Westerners, uh, East Asian participants associated only with positive messages uh, like happy, thinking, or interested, for example. So in summary, uh, this preliminary analysis uh, showed that across both cultures, uh, where we uh, tested uh, how these different types of movements are associated with certain social messages, uh, we've actually found that expanding movements are mostly associated with positive social messages and high arousal states. Uh, by contrast, contraction movements are mostly associated with negative messages. And there were some cultural differences uh, for individual phase movements, and also some types of contractions were less clear. Uh, 
And this could also partly uh, due to be due to our uh, definition of what's a contraction um, and what's an expansion. Uh, for example, if we look at the lip stretcher, it kind of uh, expands the face horizontally, but it uh, uh, compresses the lips vertically. Uh, so we're still trying to run different analysis of how the uh, actual shapes of the face uh, change in the movements. However, this is some first preliminary evidence that there might be some iconic potential uh, in these phase movements. And so uh, what we actually want to do next now is we want to actually uh, directly test this kind of uh, iconic signaling ability of the phase uh, in experiments to see whether these movements uh, that maybe have some iconic capacity uh, are actually used iconically in actual communication, for example, as a pragmatic marker. And in, in this study, uh, Benitez Quiroz uh, et al., for example, identified um, a kind of uh, a collection of action units that give rise to what they call the no phase, so this kind of phase of disapproval, which they found to be used in conversations. And so we're interested in finding more of these kind of pragmatic markers um, and also how they interact with, uh, with speech, actually, uh, in communication. Similarly, it has been shown that uh, gestures can map all kinds of meanings. So, for example, in the recent study by Wooden and colleagues, they found that these pinching gestures uh, kind of uh, relate to size. So if you're talking about very large or tiny numbers, and you can see that the subject here is also kind of squeezing her eyes. So we're interested in whether, for example, the eyes could also correlate to uh, concrete or more abstract uh, conceptual domains like shape or size uh, and all kinds of other concepts uh, that could possibly be represented iconically in the face. And so in order to study also how uh, the uh, facial expressions interact with speech in a multimodal way, we have recently uh, managed to pair our these dynamic stimuli that I showed you uh, with speech using a, a deep learning method where we can feed an audio file uh, to uh, our stimuli and then synchronize realistic lip movements. And with this, uh, we can test, for example, how uh, facial expression modulates speech in, in dialogue. So uh, one project that I'm working on now is related to confidence. So if you're giving an answer to someone who asks you a question, then usually you also mark how confident you are in the answer. And uh, we are modulating the, uh, the facial movements, uh, for example, when someone says yes or no, uh, to see uh, whether random facial movements can actually uh, affect how confident that person is. To show you some examples, here's uh, some recordings. Yes. Yes. So you might have noticed yes. that uh, even though the sound was exactly the same, there seems to be some kind of perceptual modulation going on. And so in this way, we can vary both uh, visual parameters and acoustic parameters uh, to kind of test in what way these different channels uh, interact. Yes. Yes. OK, so yes. in conclusion, uh, Facial movements have so far, unfortunately, been uh, kind of neglected in discussions of language origins, um, partly uh, because of these historical origins that uh, I talked about, the kind of, that it was mostly biologists and uh, psychologists looking at them in affective, uh, in affective science. And a lot of linguists have started out with gesture, uh, possibly because it's easier to study uh, due to the complexity, but they form uh, an essential part of multimodal expressions. They are uh, deeply involved and embedded in these kind of complex signals that we produce when we talk to each other. Uh, and so data-driven methods can help us explain agnostically uh, how individual movements actually combine to these complex messages across social and pragmatic contexts. And we can also use this to study the cultural evolution of facial expressions and their variation. And we have some preliminary findings that suggest that face, uh, the face kind of possesses some iconic potential, which we want to explore more. So in future research, we'll address how facial expressions are used to convey more complex meanings and modulate speech to create complex uh, multimodal signals. Yeah, I would like to say, uh, thank my colleagues from the University of Glasgow and the ERC project that's funding this, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you.